I had some very interesting conversations with the various John Lennon Facebook uh, fan groups because I've been in there, you know, talking about the book, and they're very, very resistant to the idea that Lennon, Lennon belongs in the Dylan, Lennon, Marks and God, that God and Lennon should be in that title together. It was an extraordinary turnaround because, you know, Dylan had been this sort of spokesperson for the, the younger generation in the 60s. And, uh, and, and he turns around and he doesn't just become some sort of casual Christian, but like real, like preaching in between songs. You know, the man who never speaks mm. between songs suddenly starts preaching in between songs. And even as a Christian, when I went along to see him in San Francisco, I thought, whoa, this is a bit, this is a bit too much. Well, hello, welcome along to today's show. Do make sure to like and subscribe to the channel if you're interested in these kinds of conversations between Christians and non-Christians. Uh, you can also find links to our newsletter and our podcast as well with today's show. Today, we're talking about John Lennon, Bob Dylan and searching for God in music. Uh, with the recent release of Get Back, the eight-hour Beatles documentary by Peter Jackson, there's been a renewed interest in the Fab Four and the music of the 60s. But a new book looks at a different sort of Fab Four, Dylan. Dylan, Lennon, Marx and God is the new title from John Stewart, guitarist with British band Sleeper and The Wedding Present. Uh, in it, John compares the spiritual journeys of John Lennon and Bob Dylan and will be telling us about what he discovered along the way and how it relates to his own journey as a recovering alcoholic who no longer believes in God himself. Well, in conversation with John today is seasoned UK music journalist Steve Turner who's rewritten extensively on the intersection of pop culture and faith. Um, Steve has chronicled journeys of bands like U2 and other pop icons like the Beatles in books such as Hungry for Heaven, The Illustrated History of Gospel and Turn, Turn, Turn. So we'll be asking, what were the religious journeys of Dylan and Lennon? And did they ever find what they were looking for, <laughs> to use a lyric from another famous Christian rock star? And what does John, as a musician and curious non-believer, make of the transcendent Search for God in music. Um, looking forward to today's show. There will be links for both my guest books from today's show as well. So look out for that. Um, John, first of all, welcome along to the show. Um, great, great to meet you. I've, I've got to say, I was excited when you got in touch with me uh, last year about this book because Sleeper were one of my favourite bands as a teenager in the mid nineties. Um, so I'm very excited just to meet one of the people behind, you know, the, the, the tracks of my youth in between her and, and what do I do now and things like that. So so welcome along to the show, John. Well, thank you very much for having me. And uh, it's great to meet you, Justin. And also you, uh, you too, Steve. I've uh, got uh, quite a lot of your oh, books. You. So, uh, so I did a lot of research over the years into it. And, and so it's a pleasure to meet you both too. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I've really enjoyed reading. Dylan uh, Lennon Marx and God and and Steve himself is referenced a few times along the way as well in the book um t tell me though um, are you are you still touring with Sleeper um because because uh, I I think you know some of those Britpop bands they're they're kind of done quite a few reunion tours and things you know haven't they in recent years yeah last uh last year we did our first album Smart it was the 25th anniversary so we did a, a tour around that and this year we're going to do the It Girl uh in april and may um around the country which is our second album the the one that went platinum did quite well and yeah so we'll be doing that and then um some other mm. songs along the way in the set uh but it was great fun playing an album from front to back um yeah it was really exciting and off the back of um a couple of years of not being able to play very much it was it was great to get out fantastic yeah 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 it's interesting um I, 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 well, I see, I see if I can come along maybe to the next, to the next tour. You'd be very welcome. Good. Just drop me an email. I'll put you on the guest list. No problem. <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome. Um, tell me about your journey though, yourself, because, um, there's obviously 25 years or, or more, you know, since if you like sleeper hit, hit the charts. Um, but you've gone on quite the journey yourself in that time. Do you want to give us a very, you know, brief thumbnail sketch of what that's been like, John? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, obviously, <sighs> I started Sleeper with Louise, who's just the most amazing front person and singer-songwriter and the, the real talent in the band, to be honest with you, and um, did that for a few years after university, and then Sleeper uh, finished in about 1998, and I went to America for a couple of years and lived in LA. I uh, was lucky enough to play with Katie Lang on, on one of her records, and then uh, came back to the United Kingdom in 2000 and, and realised that I, I needed to take stock of a few things and 
uh, I'd been I had a lot of friends in Los Angeles who were in Alcoholics Anonymous there's quite a quite a huge network of AA meetings over there particularly in the music and creative community and I've got introduced to it over there and um, joined again in in London when I came up to London in in 2000 and and um, took the the 12 steps and the AA ca- came came around in the 1930s um, and the, the basic goal is is uh, step one is surrender and then you you sort of work your way through uh, through various other steps handing your life and will over to God which is step three and then um, making a kind of moral inventory of your behavior and then you you, you end up uh, step 12 you know having had a spiritual experience as a result of working these steps we uh, we helped others and that's what exactly what happened to me and I, I was lucky enough to get sober I worked it very hard and hadn't drunk since then and had a fairly profound spiritual experience as a result and spent 14 15 years very happy active in 12 step movements during which time I prayed every day and maintained a conscious contact with my higher power which is step 11 and um, it was an extremely rewarding time and probably the happiest I've ever been actually mm. and then um, around after about 15 years I just had a bit of a crisis of faith uh, largely through the reading and research I was doing into my faith I kind of wanted, wanted to understand where it had come from and, and what it was and um, and I just I just I dropped off that whole thing and stopped praying and kind of went back to the atheist that I had been originally I've, I'm still you know um, recovered and everything from that side mm. of things but I just had I so I went through a journey of gaining faith and going through that process in a very sort of kind loving guided and beneficial way and then after about 15 years and and observing it um quite assiduously and after about 15 mm. years dropping back to where i've been before um so i was interested in that process and that forms the final chapter of dylan lennon Marx, and god the the first chapter is a dual biography of them which hasn't been done before second chapter looks at uh anti-war protest songs the third and fourth chapter look at their visions of the past and their heritage mm. so it gradually widens out from a single issue yeah. of the vietnam war to yeah. history to then the great existential questions of who we are and why we're here the last chapter looks at their belief mechanisms and their faith from the perspective of psychology that's, yeah that's and, and i i think this is a really interesting in interconnection with your own story obviously in terms of the kind of conclusions you draw by the end of the book about the reasons really psychoevolutionary reasons for for the the kind of spiritual and religious journeys they've been on which i, I guess dovetail somewhat with with your own experience there mm. um but john we'll, we'll come back to all that fascinating stuff really enjoyed reading this book um lots that i learned about dylan and lennon that i didn't know in the process um steve welcome along to the show um you've you've been uh, charting you know faith and pop music and rock music for several decades now um where, where did it all begin for you steve um i mean were, were you a christian when you began sort of looking at these bands and you know i know you've been friends with bands like u2 and things since their inception almost so tell us a little bit about the journey for, for you steve well i um by the time i got into writing about music like uh was 1970 no well actually 1969 did my first article for the beatles fan magazine the beatles book monthly um <clears throat> i was already a christian my I, I was brought up in a christian family and i'd become a christian at about 18 or 19 so um i i already was you know a person of faith when i when i started writing about music so <clears throat> i was always in intri- you know when i interviewed people i'd always ask them well not always but I, I very often would ask them something about spirituality or whatever it was you know the early 70s was quite the I was really an extension of the 60s, so a lot of bands were into, you know, Eastern religion or Hinduism or Zen or whatever, and it was um, it was just a natural topic of conversation. So, um, and when I look back at the, the books I've written, they tend to be about people that have that sort of thing going on in the background, whether, I, I mean, I did a book with The Who, Pete Townsend's very interesting to talk to on the, these sorts of subjects, um, The Beatles, obviously, 
Van Morrison. Uh, in um, the, for the Beat Generation, I did a book on Jack Kerouac. <clears throat> so, although I didn't consciously set out to write books about people that uh, ask the big questions, I when I look back, that's what's attracted me. I mean, I'd be far less interested to write a book about, say, Elton John or Rod Stewart or someone that uh, doesn't seem to be interested in those sort of questions. Um, and it, and it's it's been interesting because uh, my background that I thought was an impediment when I started, you know, coming from a Christian background, became a great advantage when I talked to people like, you know, Ray Charles and Jerry Lee Lewis and Roy Orbison, people that had pretty fundamental religion in their background. So... It's, it's been a, a fascinating journey. And um, in the 80s, I did Hungry for Heaven, which is a book subtitled was Rock and Roll and the Search for Redemption. Um, and, you know, then as mentioned, a book about Van Morrison, the, the, these sort of themes kept emerging. So um, that's my story in a nutshell. Yeah. It's uh, well. Th there's a huge back catalogue of books to to look out for of uh, of Steve's. If if anyone wants to go and read some of these amazing interviews he's had with these legends of rock and pop over the years. But um, what what have you made of you know this big uh, Beatles documentary, Steve? Uh, Get back. I've I've got about a third of the way through it, and I need to devote another weekend uh, at some point to watching well, the rest of it. But, but have you been able to? Yeah, watch it? I've watched them twice. Um... I already had about 70 hours of uh, recordings that uh, that were on bootlegs that, that I'd, I'd listened to. Because oh, when, wow. when I did my book <laughs> on, um, you know, A Hard Day's Right, that, that telling the stories behind the songs, I was curious if there was any place sort of in between songs that they said, oh, you know that, and mentioned a particular song and, and mentioned mm. how they wrote it or whatever. I mean, I probably only got two or three pages of quotes actually about old songs. But it, it, it's... It's fascinating to see them work and create. I mean, particularly the the song "Get Back." I mean, to see how it starts with just mm. just a riff, and then Paul thinks "Get Back" would be yeah. A it's good just sentence. it's just it's just McCartney kind of noodling on his yeah. you know on his bass, and it's, it's a wonderful moment when you see it just start yeah, to take yeah, shape. Yeah, yeah, of this yeah. like absolutely classic song absolutely, suddenly is yeah. sort of born in in the midst of this moment of jamming. You know, well, I think yeah, the two things brilliant. that interested me about the Beatles in terms of writing about them were, one was the creative process. You know, how, how did they come up with these songs? I remember when I first read Hunter Davis's biography and he was around when they wrote uh, A Little Help From My Friends and uh, Getting Better. And uh, I thought, wow, that, you know, because people didn't tend to ask them, like, how did you write those songs? They just say, you know, what's your favorite color? Are you going to marry Jane Asher? They didn't get into the, mm -hmm. the, the writing side of things. <laughs> and the other thing I've always been interested in is, um, how much were they shaped by the culture and how much did they shape the culture? That, that sort of interplay between, mm. um, you, mm. you know, the Beatles thinking and their philosophy or whatever and, and that effect on the culture and, and how the culture affected them because they were, they were right in the centre of the storm in the 60s. They really picked up on everything that was going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, John, tell us about the book, um, because uh, obviously you, you start out really by charting the influences of both John Lennon and Bob Dylan. Um, as you say, no one's really done a side-by-side -side comparison of these two, so this is a bit of a first. But but why did you want to particularly bring them together in this way? I guess I was just massive fans of them, and um, I don't think you can not be if you're if you're interested in popular music at, at its best. And um, I think Dylan's just the most striking lyricist of the 20th century, uh, certainly in terms of folk and popular music, and and what Lennon and the Beatles did to change the form uh, and the possibilities of, of recording and also live performance as well as far as they could took it as far as it could go before they had to stop and then when you uh, when you look at the two people together because they're so influential in their fields and they influenced each other so much um, it it kind of enhances your view of the individual so I used this device dual biography which has been used quite a lot recently um, to look at historical figures. Uh, it was first done by Eloise Knapp Hay, who was a, uh, a literary theorist, I think, in the 1950s in America. And she argued that a good dual biography, by putting two people side by side, you learn more about them than you would with an individual account. And I just thought that was really interesting with Dylan and Lennon because Dylan had a much stronger relationship with George Harrison, 
but it's his relationship with John Lennon that's got all the um, mm. interesting parts in, partly because of the clash of egos. And obviously Harrison himself was on a massive spiritual journey and it was kind of almost difficult to keep him out of the book because my partner's a Harry Krishna and um, I'm quite familiar with, with his account. And his, his accounts of their meetings mm. was very important. He, you know, he brought Dylan and... Lennon together at the Isle of Wight Festival and and, um, and was behind quite a lot of those p collaborations or quite a lot that didn't happen, you know, and the communication between them. But um, it's Lennon and, and Dylan as two, as two iconic figures that I felt really stood out. And I've got to ask, what, what's Mark's got to do with it all as well? He's the fourth yeah, character. Yeah, so, the, so the, um, the, the dual biography element traces their story together. Lots of, uh, I try and capture all their known meetings. There's some that, some that are less well-known, uh, such as a recording studio in, in New York in, I think it was 1971 or two. Um, I spoke to David Peel, who was there when, when Lennon was producing his record, and they invited Dylan down, and then he, he walked out of the session when he heard the song. Um, and uh, so it was really interesting to, to put their history together, and then the next two sections, I was, I was fascinated in protest music, and there's a sociologist, an American sociologist called R. Serge Denisov, who's who wrote the first real kind of sociological analysis of what protest music is and how it works. So I used his perspective to examine their anti-war protest music, the kind of international politics that they wrote about. And he's uh, he's a old school, died in the wall American Marxist Leninist type. And um, and then the second part that looks at their sense of the past and their heritage, I used an American literary theorist called Frederick Jameson, who's also a very well known uh, Marxist. He takes a Marxist approach to literary theory. Uh, so it looks at things like class and history and all that kind of stuff. So I use that as a framework to think about mm. how they thought about their history. So, and then the the final part is obviously their faith. So I just wonder. I I imagine them in a band together, Dylan Lennon, yes. Marks and Guard. That's sort of what the front <laughs> cover. But, uh, as I say, the the ultimate Fab Four right there. Yeah. But, um, yeah. <laughs> Let, let we're going to obviously focus more on the faith part yes. than the marks part in, in our discussion today but um may, maybe you could you could um you know and be interested in steve just popping in on this as well as as you want to steve but t take us sort of through the journey of of um john lennon and bob dylan respectively in terms of their 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 particular you know relationship to faith i mean most people in lennon's case I, I maybe make a lot out of the imagine as you know and it's famous lyric about imagine there's no heaven and so on it, and think well he was probably basically an atheist uh, even if the beatles went off on some interesting you know spiritual retreats and, and whatever um what what was um lennon's overall sort of relationship with faith though up to the point that, that he actually died well like most of these things it's far more complex and nuanced than than you imagine and um you know he he grew up with um uh, if if you've ever been to his house, the the house he grew up in with his aunt, aunt Mimi, you know it's quite a nice middle class Liverpool house on the exterior, but she was actually very poor. She she put had to put up student lodges and slept on the ground floor in a tiny little room. And, um, was someone who tried to provide structure for her nephew's life, and John had a, a very difficult early life. His father was away; was a merchant seaman and um disappeared for long periods of time and uh, i trace that in the kind of the history section his connections to empire and the, the old ideas of the british empire are quite profound and they obviously appear in his music in all kinds of different ways and um and his his mum you know had some various difficult circumstances such that his aunt contacted the or threatened to contact the social services to 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 become his essentially step parent and then her partner who became his an early version of his his surrogate father died when he was 11 and then and and much of his life i think psychologically was a search for a father figure so whether it's brian epstein or george martin um or the people who came along in his life later um there's a there's a very interesting book by henry sullivan uh the beatles and lacan which is a freudian analysis of 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 the four Beatles and the work on John's really interesting. It, it really kind of goes into that element of his search for 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 a father figure, and um, I think a lot of those people that he 
comes across in his life who become inspirations to him and he just dives into it are obviously connected with various forms of spirituality and religion and that was an ever present in his life the supernatural he was a he was a chorister he went to sunday school at the church around the corner the same place that he met paul i think although steve's going to correct me if i get any of this wrong <laughs> thank you for you and uh, and um and and uh and he also, like a lot of creatives, you know, he had this sort of um, visionary thinking element from quite a young age. So he describes as, as a, a young boy about kind of having visions and seeing, you know, essentially what we consider super, would be considered supernatural phenomena in his life in one way or another. So it's quite, although, although he kicked against organized religion and also God, you know, in the song God famously, mm. that does not mean to say he was not a supernatural uh, and mm. spiritual thinker. And he, uh, my argument in the book is that at its core, uh, he was not a Marxist. So Marx's approach to religion famously, you know, is, is that religion is the opium of the people. And um, that was not John Lennon. He even joined the fourth international when I look at his politics and his history, he joined a Marxist revolutionary group led by Tarek Ali and a bunch of other people in the 1970s who were profoundly anti-religious in mm. a very old school mm. sort of Richard Dawkins way, which I, is not my approach at all. I think religion mm. has, has lots of positives to, to bring people and um, was very active in that. Around about the time he was writing those 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 songs that are against organized religion, but he he dropped that because at his core, his whole political and personal belief is to do with consciousness. He believed that consciousness was how you change the world. So you change you, and then the world changes around you. Mm. So he might sing Imagine No Religion, but the actual message of Imagine is if you only think and believe something hard enough, the world around you will change, which is very yeah. similar to Dylan's approach, which is inspired by transcendentalism, which is another you know very important religious well, literary tradition in America. Before we move on on to Dylan as well, uh, Steve, any, any comments to add on both Lennon's own sort of faith commitments um, as far as we can, you know, ascertain them? And also just generally how the Beatles approached faith and their music, because I, I feel like they were very much at, at the front end of this sort of interest in Eastern religion and so on that, that obviously marked out a lot of the, you know, the, the counterculture, the hippie movement and everything else of the 60s and 70s. Well, as as John said, he um, he went to the local church. You joined the Sunday school. That I mean, the church was like uh, the centre of the community in those days. If you read the Liverpool Echo for that period, you you know bishops and vicars were very important. They'd be on the front pages. Their opinions were respected. So he he was part of that life. But like almost all of his friends, they as soon as they left school, that was that was the end of church. It was just like a, a complete break. Um, but but he he retained um, a great knowledge of of the Bible. I mean, if you read his interviews, the number of times he he casually alludes to some parable or some saying of Christ. And then I think when when they started to get famous, I think he started to identify with Jesus in in a way like. Well, I, I interviewed John in seventy one, and he said to me, "You can imagine um, if we had come about." back then you know four guys with long hair and robes and and all the people were following them he said you could imagine how a kind of mythology would have built up around them um so i think he identified with somebody uh, who, who was mystical who had a relationship with god and and who was uh, leading people and looked up to you know how many how many other people are there around or in history that you can relate to and i think he jesus became important to him and i think John mentioned in his book, and I, I mentioned in mine, there was there was a time when he actually thought he was Jesus kind of reincarnated or something. He goes into Apple and... Yeah, I mean, th this is kind of the the kind of <laughs> the quite extreme end, if you like, of, of, of where John goes eventually in his sort of religious understanding, yeah. let's say. Um, I mean, what was behind that? Because, cause, you know, people like Bono kind of jokingly talk about a kind of messiah complex, but, but it sounds almost like Lennon literally did have a kind of view that he was the second coming or something for a while, at least. Where where was that coming from, Steve? Oh, I, I think it's a mixture of drugs and um, his fascination with Jesus and the kind of just the general uh, kind of spiritual temperature of that time you know the late 60s there were all sorts of odd people like the process group walking around london in black cloaks and uh, 
th there was a lot going on in that area, and, and John was quite sort of partial to it. That's why it's difficult to talk about John's beliefs, because he, he, he fluctuated so much. I mean, John mentioned in his mm. book uh, as well about the time, like, not all that long before he died, where he has a sort of mini conversion and, and starts watching evangelists on television. You would never think John would do that. And he sees John, uh, Jesus of Nazareth TV films and, and that that works on him as well. Um, so he, he he's dancing about hither and thither. But as he said in, I think it was in his Playboy interview, one of the last interviews he did that, you know, I, people think I'm not a religious guy, but I am. I think he was fascinated by religion. He's mm. always reading about it and thinking about it. Um, that's a very yeah. interesting. Get sorry, I was going to say I had some very interesting conversations with the various John Lennon Facebook uh, fan groups because I've been in there, you know, talking about the book, and they're very, very resistant to the idea that Lennon Lennon belongs in the Dylan Lennon Marks and God that God and Lennon should be in that title together. And I'm like, you understand, he was calling televised television evangelist in the 1970s he wrote a lot you know uh songs you know about prayer and god with yoko and 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 was profoundly interested in that stuff uh, towards the end of his what turned out to be the end of his life so but, but people are quite resistant to that they don't that, that's they really don't interesting that. isn't it mm. yeah what well, obviously some people feel like no we've got to have john lennon in this box of oh he wasn't spiritual he energy. wasn't spiritual yeah, in any way yeah. he was he was yeah, yeah. he was very yeah, much yeah. against that and i'm like no it actually was a deeply profound spiritual thinker yeah. and yeah. and as steve said he, he went through lots of different you know from transcendental meditation and his diet in the 1970s and um the therapies he was doing primal screen therapy lots of different things that invoke different ways of of bringing supernatural ideation into our into our you know understanding our subconscious through that um yeah, it was yeah. A, that was a heart of who he was yeah well we'll, we'll come on in a moment we could, we're just going to go to our break slightly early and we'll, we'll we'll come back to talk about um bob dylan who who in a way you know has had a very well publicized you know conversion back in i think it was 1978 um and and we'll talk about you know his journey and then how it intersects with with Lenin's spirituality as well. And and I'm, I want to kind of return to your story as well, John, as we do that, because I think where your book goes is, is quite interesting in the way you bring these journeys together. Yeah, One super ahead. quick thought. Uh, it was Lenin's reading of the Passover plot, which is a sort of a conspiracy theory book about, about Jesus and the disciples in, in the 60s, that triggered his comment about Jesus, that it ultimately meant the Beatles stopped touring. And that single book, which is a sort of pseudo historical account of the New Testament, turned out to be the most influential book in the history of popular music because he'd never read that and he'd never made that comment to Maureen Cleves. The Beatles would probably have still kept touring and Sgt. Peppers would have never been made. So the, the, it's there at, <laughs> at, at, at lots of different levels, not just yeah. the, the blatantly obvious stuff that he said, but mm. the things that mm. happened around him. Um, you know, it's uh, the the, it, the plot of the Passover plot, the the subtext, the the message of that book is right in that Maureen Cleave interview. He's clearly just read it and he's spouting it yeah, to Maureen Cleave, yeah. and it, and it absolutely took completely changed the history of popular music. In, 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 extraordinary, isn't it? The 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 the, the, what, the off the cuff comments that can completely. But the change idea the that the idea that, that biblical yeah. history and Jesus has no yes, influence on that exactly. It, that's literally oh. it's the single most important yeah. book written in the story of popular music, in my view. It, 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 there you go. So, yeah. <laughs> well, look, we're going to continue talking about Dylan Lennon, Marx and God. It's the new book by John Stewart. Uh, in conversation today with Steve Turner, seasoned UK music journalist. We're talking about the search for God in music today. Have you ever found yourself tongue-tied when someone asks you, is there evidence for God? What about suffering? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? I'd like to introduce you to Confident Christianity, our online apologetics course, featuring video training from world-renowned thinkers such as William Lane Craig, John Lennox, Amy Orr Ewing and Gary Habermas. You'll learn how to understand, defend and share your faith with confidence. I'll also share lessons I've learned from over 15 years of hosting atheists and Christians in dialogue. You can enrol now at premier.org.uk forward slash course or click the link with this video.
Welcome back to today's show. We're talking about John Lennon, Bob Dylan, Searching for God in Music, new book by John Stewart, uh, the guitarist with Sleeper and the Wedding Present, uh, talks about their spiritual journeys, uh, Bob Dylan and John Lennon, that is, and sort of analyzes it through a Marxist framework, talks about the religious aspect of this. And we'll come back to John's own story as well, which is a fascinating one, uh, because he was a religious person for 14 or 15 years as a recovering alcoholic through AA, but ultimately decided actually um, uh, the, there was a psychological evolutionary explanation for his religious experience and probably the religious experiences of people like Lennon and Dylan. But we're, maybe we'll come to all that a bit later. Um, Steve Turner is with us today as well. Um, Steve, I, I'm just bowled over by the fact that you've interviewed John Lennon for goodness sake that's that itself is kind of like crazy to me um um Bob Dylan have you ever have you ever interviewed Bob uh, in in all the years you've been no doing I've, journalism? I've met him a couple of times but um I haven't interviewed him I, I met him because uh, I first met T-Bone Burnett who was part of his Rolling Thunder tour band and T-Bone became a Christian and a couple of other guys on that tour and I, I got to know T-Bone and um we went along to see the first of his Born Again concerts in San Francisco in, I think, 1979. And, uh, uh, and we went backstage in San Diego to see him. No, in Los Angeles, Santa Monica. And then we went backstage in um, uh, San Diego. Uh, so briefly met him, but yeah. uh, n- well, no well, conversation. You, you- you may not have asked him directly, but I'm sure you're familiar with with his spiritual journey. Do you want to just give us again a thumbnail sketch of of Bob's um, sort of relationship with faith and and what triggered this you know you know quite right. spectacular conversion really in, in 1978? Well, you know he's brought up in a Jewish family and in, in Minnesota, and uh, he seems always to have had particularly a, a strong connection with morality and with judgment. That came into all of his early songs, or many of his early songs. But also, uh, as John points out in his book, um, it, it, was, uh, it wasn't a Jewish town. It was a, it was a largely Christian town. So he, like Leonard Cohen almost, like he was able to mix in what he knew of Catholicism and Protestantism with what he uh, knew of Judaism. And um, so that they were always present in his songs. He seems to have gone through a period where Zen Buddhism was uh, very influential on him. And then through a girl he met, uh, uh, an African-American girl who uh, had sort of come back to the church, she got him to come along to the Vineyard Church in in L.A. in 78, I think it was. Uh, And through her, he he says he has a born-again experience. Then he starts going to a discipleship class that they run at the Vineyard. Uh, a lot of his early songs, particularly on Slow Train Coming and um, Saved, I think were, you can almost figure out what Bible study he'd been in before he wrote the song. The songs were almost like illustrations of particular passages from the Bible. It was an extraordinary turnaround because, you know, Dylan had been this sort of spokesperson for the the younger generation in the 60s. And, uh, and, and he turns around and he doesn't just become some sort of casual Christian, but like real like preaching in between songs. You know, the man who never speaks Mm. between songs suddenly starts preaching in between songs. And even as a Christian, when I went along to see him in San Francisco, I thought, whoa, this is a bit, this is a bit too much. You know, couldn't couldn't he be more like C.S. Lewis than uh, Billy Sunday? Uh, (laughs) But um, then then he did a trio of albums that were strong reflections of of this turnaround in, in his faith. And since then, I mean, the big question is like, is he still a Christian? And people hunt through the albums like or, or or the sets like is he still singing that song he's certainly not um uh, you know he's he's dropped the the preacher side of 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 the faith that he had but but still you still realize he's writing out of a spiritual framework i mean those things are are important to him and but the the last quote that i saw of him talking about faith was he talked about the almost like the religion of song and he quoted a, a number of songs like I, I saw the light and uh, a few different songs like that and he said that his faith was basically made up of these great insights that songwriters had had over the years he's a hard guy to pin down yeah um, mm. what 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 john was the kind of reaction uh, as far as you can see from his audience from the public generally to this this quite radical well conversion? i was a, i was a fan and i remember those records coming out just it, it was like being slapped in the face 
by a shovel. It was in, it was completely out of the blue at the time, and um, particularly a lot of people. It's a very similar thing with with Lennon and his quote unquote. He can't possibly be spiritual. He had no he had no faith and belief. And and with with Dylan, he he very he wrote lots of protest songs in his his sort of first bout of songwriting in New York. And then just wound it in because he thought what happened to people that were in public life in America with with strong political views, which is essentially they would get assassinated, which, which is ultimately what happened to Lenin. He was far more naive about that, and um, and he just wound it back quite severely and started writing far more oblique protest songs and hit hiding the message in his songs or or songs with very strong biblical messages like all along the Watchtower, which then people reinterpret as an anti-Vietnam War song. So it, exactly as Steve said, he grows up in a in a, a a part of the what's kind of near the Midwest with very strong church tradition. He's got a Jewish family background. He's clearly got a very 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 deep understanding of the Old Testament. It features in his songs in the Jeremiah's and the, and the the judgmental stuff comes from there and the moral message and and and. And I think in many ways, Bob is far more conservative than most of his fans would like him to think. Certainly if you read his memoir where he cites Barry Goldwater as his favourite politician from the 60s, which I've spoken to people about and they've gone, well, he's clearly just lying. And I'm like, well, you don't, if that's his memoir. That's what you want him to be lying. But that's his record of, of you know, he's put it. And exactly the same thing happened with his, he, you know, it, he went, quote unquote, went electric, picked up an electric guitar in the mid 60s, upset all his fans then. The truth is, he'd always been a rocker. He, his favourite artist when he was at school was Little Richard. He'd, he'd, he, he had Pete Seeger threatened to, to cut the guitar cord when he was playing at the Newport Festival, famously. His headmaster at his school had threatened to do the same thing when he was doing a rock gig uh, at the age of 16 in the school, in the school hall. So, He'd always been a rocker, so he, he kind of went back to that, and be, largely under the influence of the Beatles, of course. Um, and um, so when he had his religious conversion, I think there's two things about that. The first is that it's it's Dylan being true to himself, and he's true to himself more than he is to his fans, and he's also part of him being true to himself. I think it's the ex the extreme situation of being so very famous is that you just you have to hide some of yourself to be true to yourself and you know bob dylan the person is not bob dylan the public figure they're two very different things uh and so he, he it's very brave to to do that when you know it shows the depth and the profundity of his experience and also it was nothing mm. new it was a huge mm. shock to fans like me at the time who you know i was a young atheist very political very much looking for these sort of influential left-wing people who could help me understand the world and then for them to do that it's a kind of a betrayal and you know we're we're very very um suspicious of people that betray our our beliefs it's you know, psychologically it's not something that sits very well with us and yeah he did that he did that in the 70s and people just refused to believe it and he was being booed at concerts again and i think he's still i my personal view obviously it it it's difficult to, to know for sure but i i there's a movement called jews for jesus in america who are essentially jewish people who convert to christianity and I think he's probably not necessarily aligned with them because he doesn't really join groups as such. But his idea of spirituality and God is probably quite similar to that. It's it's politically quite conservative. Yeah. It's very pro-Israel. And, um, you know, Jesus himself was a Jew. So <laughs> why shouldn't the Jews be for Jesus? Uh, you know, so well, he's yeah. um, he's following in that, in that tradition, I guess. And the interesting observation... Mm. I think that people ignore is there's been a faith song on virtually every album of original material he's put out. There's been one on there. Don't ask me to name them, but but there are. Every album has a song with there. profound yeah. religious yeah. lyrics and intent on it. Yeah, uh, not just yeah. the three faith albums that he produced, which also sound better than any of his music prior to that. Mm. And famously, mm. he doesn't get on with producers. There's a huge chapter in his memoir about how difficult he found it to work with Daniel Lenoir, who was making him do take after take of stuff. He finds God and he wants his music to sound good because now he's singing for God. So he pulls in different producers and he's, he does take, he does several takes. Prior to that, almost all his music that stops at the third take, you're hearing the first three takes, unlike the Beatles, yeah. who famously did, you know, 50 takes of some songs. Dylan's just three yeah. takes and then moves on. And then it's, his, his <laughs> religious records sound spectacular as a result, I think. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I mean, Steve, just just comment on the, the generally, you know, th- there's been a, a split historically between sort of what you might call Christian music, quote unquote, that's specifically produced for a kind of Christian subculture, especially in the USA. And then these artists who are huge mainstream figures um, like Dylan and so on, you uh, two and, and, you know, you could talk about Kanye West and, you know, Stormzy today and, and so on but who who have a tendency to quite often put their their religious views quite explicitly into their music and it can either work or sometimes turn the fans off but um it feels like very often it's 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 not fully appreciated how much people's religious beliefs christian beliefs actually do inspire their music i suppose in that sense steve when when many fans kind of maybe just are in it for the music not for the the kind of lyrics behind it necessarily what what do you think of that steve um, to go back to talking about when Dylan became a Christian, the thing I noticed was people think like rock and roll is rebellious and people are going out and, and they're, they're kind of astounding the audience and upsetting them. But they're not. I mean, when I saw the Sex Pistols at the 100 Club, yeah, they're, they're rebellious, but the whole audience is too. They're, they're, they're all on the same side. When I saw Dylan in San Francisco, it was like these people had originally come to Dylan as, as being a spokesman for a, a different you know, alternative way of life and he's coming back and accusing them you know he's saying you know you better wake up and you're dead and um, he, he was challenging the audience you know people liked it when when Dylan was pointing the finger at something you know, like the Mr Jones or the, the square character mm. but he was actually attacking them and, and they were I don't think I've ever been in a concert where I sense the audience felt under attack and some people were walking out, you know, because of what he was saying. Um, mm. But your your question, I, I think, um, I remember somebody calling me up uh, late 70s. They said, have you heard of this punk band in Dublin? They're, they're a punk band and they're called U2, and, and, but they're Christians, but they're not like a Christian punk band. They're just, they're just in a punk band and they happen to be Christians. And I, I was absolutely fascinated and of course I went, went to see them and then eventually got to know them. And, um, that's the difference, like people trying to just write about everything, but they obviously have a Christian worldview and they just want to be on a, a regular label and, and playing to regular people. The Christian music industry in America, particularly at that time, was, um, you, you know, people playing in churches to, to teenagers who probably weren't allowed to go to secular concerts. So this was their kind of way of letting off a bit of steam. But you know christian bands they had to use certain phrases on their albums you know larry norman who was a kind of like a christian bob dylan figure before bob dylan came along um i mean he would get ostracized for not you know not using sort of upfront language in some of his songs you know you you couldn't really use poetry you had to be very direct so yeah there's certainly more opportunity the, the, i mean i've done a biography of johnny cash now he's a good example of somebody who was mainstream yet had a very deep faith you know of course he made lots of mistakes on the way but um you know he was a man whose study was full, full of theological books people really underestimate that yeah. Not non-christian rock and roll fans are really missing out they're really only getting half the story speaking of someone who's not, you know not 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 a christian as such um little richard i mean the list is almost well as long as the list of, of famous rockers and 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 then you think about soul music and and the african-american music tradition it started in the church you know sam cook and 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 that whole sort of gospel gospel r&b divide um lots of those early r&b songs were gospel songs re and 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 that whole concept of desire and 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 our sort of our relationship with our body and our mind and our, and and who we are and what we want out of life they 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 parallel very consciously between the 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 experience of 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 having faith and the experience of making music they they're quite aligned you step out of yourself you try and do something beyond who you are you try and connect mm. with other people you're trying to make something happen that's 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 quite tangible but also intangible you know music it's vibrations and in there, the air there's so, obviously there's obviously also this this kind of extraordinary overlap really between the religious experience and what music does isn't there and and you know if you go to a, a sort of sublime concert whether it be classical music or u2 or whatever um you can come away feeling like you've you've just had a, a an spiritual experience you know it, it, in its very best moments that's what's kind of trying to be evoked almost um and and obviously probably most of the greatest songs and melodies and everything ever written have come out of you know whether it be 
extreme historical situations like you know the s slavery and so on that that kind of birthed the um the, the spirituals and so on of that era uh, and that were then adapted for you know blues and rock and roll and everything else later on down the line it's 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 often tied to you know really huge experiences spiritual experiences and everything else going on i mean john where does that leave you as someone who is an atheist basically now as, as i see it and the fact that for so many people their music has to be tied to a very kind of something beyond us something that is really uh transcendent let's say um and and wouldn't be happy wouldn't settle for it all being able to be boiled down to a kind of material psychological evolutionary kind of yeah it's a, it's a difficult one i think it's it's um it's it's the ultimate challenge i mean steve was talking about dylan challenging his audience and i think in some ways our, our faith and our our metaphysics and our view of the world is the ultimate challenge for who we are and um as a as a creative artist anybody whether they're in visual or or or, or write a, a writer on the page or uh, particularly a musician because that's so connected to time you know the, th the two minutes or the three minutes that you're playing music it, you, your your creativity is connected very much to the moment that you're in unlike whereas with a painting or a piece of literature you could return to the page later um you're 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 trying to connect with other people which means having an emotional relationship with someone who's maybe in the same space or connecting to them via recorded music you're trying to put something of yourself on the tape or into the computer and you're, you're doing it through a sense of trying to express something that somebody else is going to connect with on quite a profound level so all of those things use the same psychological processes that that we use in in spiritual practices the togetherness that you mentioned at the song i mean the reason why that concert in san francisco is possibly so memorable and felt so jarring at the time was because you didn't have the togetherness that you would have at a great gig you had the opposite everyone's probably feeling really uneasy and feeling uneasy in a crowd is is a profoundly unpleasant experience whereas feeling together in a crowd it's a profoundly rewarding one um for somebody of faith which i've spent many hours in 12-step meetings meditating and and experiencing that feeling that's that's something above you or beyond you connect you're connecting with something that's that's there not necessarily external because it's in everyone it's it's a it's that profound experience of faith which is which is such an important an essential element of many people's lives and then at the other end of that there's the the kind of the sign quote unquote scientific um discussion of what what that experience actually is when it happens in your head what what's the hormones and the and the brain chemicals going on and i guess personally i've always i've bounced between those um you know i grew up in sheffield during the 1980s so my experience my early experience was the minor strike and got very influenced by that kind of um left-wing uh non-spiritual materialist worldview uh, marx famously is a, is a historical materialist he views the materials that we make mm. and the ownership of those and how how that how they're organized as the thing that determines society and various religions are just one expression of that and that's why lenin wasn't a, wasn't a marxist uh, neither is dylan because they both mm. profoundly connected to mm. their sense of con the subconscious and and their sense of the spiritual they believe that's what drives us and i think you're either on one side or the other of that of that debate and what's what's interesting to me now is that they they have there are those gray areas that have been illuminated by science so there's lots of interesting research into the benefits of faith i'm not somebody who says that religion is a bad thing i think it's an absolutely necessary way of organizing ourselves and um i've benefited from it i'm sober because of it so i'm not somebody who takes that sort of richard dawkins view of or, or religion is bad i think religion is mm. profoundly necessary and very important to the human experience um and even if god doesn't exist he got that's him on the phone there even if god doesn't exist <laughs> uh he got me sober so um you know that's a, so that's a great example yeah, of yeah. um the one of those psychological <laughs> mechanisms because when i was when i was i would have thought that's literally an intervention from outside how 
you know that's a message from the outside world and i, I think we're yeah we're evolutionary yeah. i mean maybe it is but uh, there's also an argument to suggest that well, we're kind of I, programmed to interpret things in that way mm. well I, I want to come back to this in a, in a minute but but steve your your thoughts on this because i'm sure you've run into this sort of whole question of of whether you know these religious artists that you've interviewed are actually connecting with something divine or or, or can it all be explained kind of sociologically yeah. culturally scientifically and so on Okay, I wanted to say, um, I was thinking of two things. Well, one is, it's really important to realise that rock and roll was um, built in the most kind of evangelical Christian area, probably of the world, you know, the southern states. <laughs> um, and all, almost all of the people that I can think of that were pioneers of rock and roll had this discussion going on in their head, like, am I doing the right thing? Like Elvis, you know, should I be singing mm. gospel or should I? Th there was there was no blending of the two. You either did one or you did the other. I interviewed Ray Charles. He told me uh, he'd always had this belief that you shouldn't, uh, you, you know, you shouldn't sing gospel if if you're a, a soul singer. You know, they're, they're they're two very separate categories. You know, God and Mammon. You 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 can't mix them up. Um, so all those people had that kind of inner conflict. Jerry Lee Lewis records great balls of fire yeah? as he's recording it he thinks this is i'm sending people to hell and he argues with sam phillips, <laughs> sam phillips no 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 but uh, we it's hard for us to imagine uh, from the perspective mm. of 2022 that these people had these spiritual conflicts like that the other thing i wanted to say is i remember interviewing pete townsend from the who we were talking about um why do so many musicians uh, why are they attracted to spirituality why do they get involved with the religion and he said, well, you know, when you play a certain note and you see the effect it has on people, you start to think, or, or combination of notes, like why, why that particular combination of notes? Why is it having this effect on these people? And he says, once you ask that question, you ask another question, another question. He said, soon you're on a kind of a spiritual journey because you're asking like the basic questions about, you know, what is a human being? I, I, think, I think a lot of music and a lot of art... Um, enlarges people it makes them feel sort of big and grand and and reminds them of their dignity as human beings and i would say as a christian reminds them that they're made in the image of god that they're, they're, there's something grand about being a human this may not be uh, like a a spiritual experience like actually touching god but but it, it reminds people of the uh, of who they are that they're not just kind of rubbish and disposable um and What's your answer to, to those who do kind of give a quite a kind of, in a sense, materialistic explanation ultimately, while acknowledging the important place of faith and religion mm -hmm. in, in inspiring, you know, extraordinary music and right. experience and so on, but still say, ultimately, we have a satisfactory explanation that it, you know, which is basically about neurons and chemicals in your brain. That's yeah. that's why that chord that Pete Townsend said has an extraordinary yeah, yeah, effect yeah, yeah. is actually what's actually going on is is something in here rather than something I can, out I there. I can only say it makes more sense to me in the Christian framework than it does outside of it, because you could say falling in love is just, um, uh, you know, it's just material in your head doing certain things. And you might on paper think, yeah, that's fine. But in your heart, you think, no, it's, it's more than that. You know. Um, I'm kind of curious about people that I've interviewed that have had uh, spiritual experiences, you might call them, but they haven't initiated them. They've just happened. Like Van Morrison would talk about walking around Belfast and he suddenly was just like overwhelmed and, and he didn't know what it was. And it was only many years later when he started to read about, you know, Coleridge or Wordsworth and different romantic poets and Blake and people in history that had, had these experiences, he realised he wasn't on, on his own. John mentioned in his book about John Lennon, you know, having what he described as trancing in alpha experiences when he was a kid, like he'd be in a field or up in the north of Scotland and he'd suddenly have this overwhelming experience, couldn't explain it, which is probably another reason why John couldn't be a sort of hard-headed materialist. He'd had too many experiences like that. I'd be interested to hear from you, John, what, when you talked about praying and, and religion, was it, did it become the Christian religion because you were from England? What, did it have a kind of a, a religious framework or were you just talking to it? Um, no, it was, um, it was the God of the Bible, I think. But, um, All right. 
What, what, why the God of the Because violence? I think that's just because of my cultural background, you know, from England and stuff. But also, um, and I went, I did, I prayed in church when I regularly lived next to a church, prayed in the church every day, went, didn't go to many services as such, um, still go to uh, Christmas Eve, can't resist that, and sing, probably I'm singing louder than anybody else in the church. And, um, and I'm sober, everyone else is drunk. Um, <laughs> And um, I, uh, and probably because most of the AA meetings I attended were in church halls as well. So, um, but um, I guess th- that's. I think there's something specific about Christianity that's really important culturally. I- I- even if you are an atheist, you have to acknowledge that Christianity is a unique religion, and that most of the scientific advances that we have today happened under christianity they did happen under islam you know previously things like um early examples of maths and lots of early scientific islam had a a kind of a scientific blooming period um in its earlier years but certainly the in the modern world is shaped by scientific advances that were were you know newton darwin darwin who lost his faith obviously but the the situation Mm. he was in um, and lots of other people were, you know, pretty devout Christians who also made the sort of discoveries that, that drove the contemporary world. So much like music, you can't really pull them apart. And, um, I mean, I, I went to the, I went to Jerusalem after a few years in, and, and that was a very profound experience to experience, you know, the church, of the Holy Sepulchre and all that kind of, uh, and just to, I really enjoyed watching other people, uh, in faith as well. I think it's, uh, I always I feel sorry for atheists who've never experienced faith. I think they've missed out in a way. Um, so what what disappointed you about Christianity? In the nothing. End? It's the happiest I've ever been. It, not literally. Oh, okay. not, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's an amazing way to live, and I would never ever want to discourage anybody from following it. And I, I take even though I don't attend to us that means today, I still take students to meetings if 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 I think it would benefit them. Um, I guess I, my own personal journey was I just I just I'd always been troubled by the sort of the reality of evolution and the the discovery of the me, you know the, sort of working out the mechanics of it. Working out the mechanics of it doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't something profound and spiritual behind it. But um, I guess that what what I just read about was enough to kind of tip me back into what my kind of previous materialistic mm. worldview and um and i think you know i i think we've lost a lot because the idea of church and regular attendance at church and 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 the the tenets of christianity are so fundamental to good pro-social behavior in many ways i think we have lost a lot by losing a lot of that even if even if you know faith isn't a thing that i ascribe to anymore I'm quite a fan of the organisation. We're going to go to a quick break um, and we'll we'll come back just to continue this conversation, really enjoying it. Um, John Lennon, Bob Dylan, The Search for God in Music is what we've been talking about. My guests are Steve Turner and John Stewart. We'll be back in just a moment. For more conversations between Christians and sceptics, subscribe to The Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to The Unbelievable newsletter. Such an interesting conversation today. Uh, We've been looking at the spiritual journeys of John Lennon and Bob Dylan as laid out in the new book by John Stewart, uh, Dylan, Lennon, Marx and God. There'll be a link from today's show to that if you want to get hold of a copy. Steve Turner uh, is a seasoned UK music journalist who's been talking about some of the extraordinary interviews he's had over the years with various figures in pop and rock who have their own religious story to tell. And he's told some of those in books such as the ones on that specifically feature the Beatles, um, Hungry for Heaven, Illustrated History of the Gospel, Turn, 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 and many, many more I could mention. I'll, I'll make sure there's a link to, to Steve as well from today's show. Um, but we were really sort of getting into your journey there, John, um, and fascinating to hear about the way that you're still very, in a sense, open and, you know, happy about, you know, people becoming Christians. You see that the value in a sense there, you, you say it was ultimately kind of seeing behind the curtain as it were um the the kind of evolutionary psychology roots of religious experience and so on kind of made you think actually no 
what I think I experience is more to do with my brain than than an external, you know, God and and so on. I mean, Steve, again, I'm not expecting you to answer this. You are you aren't a kind of social psychologist psychologist or anything like that. You're you're a music journalist, but but at the same time, um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's almost like. It'd be hard to imagine that you could have the kind of music we've been talking about if everyone was just a materialist. It feels like people have to have that belief, don't they, Steve, to to kind of be able to imagine something bigger than than themselves sometimes. And that's kind of what I, I get the sense that you you as a Christian feel like the God thing makes sense of that aspect of who we are better than maybe the kind of materialist account of reality. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you have to be... I wouldn't say you have to be religious to create great or grand music, but certainly when we're talking about rock and roll, it's it's woven into the whole thing. You know, the the, the toing and froing, the tug of uh, secularism. I, John mentioned Sam Cooke, you know, who uh, was a well-known gospel singer and then switched to soul and, and had to hide his identity and then lost all his gospel fans. And there's, there's so many stories like that of people that have, Marvin Gaye you know they've suffered that kind of tension uh, and probably creatively that tension's been pretty good for them in many ways because it, it's given them a little struggle that, that's injected uh, some creativity into their life um, but yeah from, from my own perspective I mean the, something we haven't talked about but the whole kind of LSD experience in the, in the 60s was I think very uh, responsible for the, the the boom in spirituality and that really is um that really is happening in the brain i mean people think they're connected to you know astral journeys and different things but i think it it, it is within the brain and there's been far more research done on it recently i mean imperial college in london uh, they've got a de- uh, i guess a department or something sort of focused on on research into lsd and you can now see you you can sort of wire people up and x-ray them and you can see what's actually happening in their brains but that you know when when people took lsd the the the, the sort of dividers that we normally have in our mind all, all kind of collapse and and things blend together and so people come out of that experience thinking like you know, I was one with the universe and, and now I've got to go back to sort of reality and they try to recapture that feeling of being one with the universe. And they also feel this universal love, you know, not a love for like you and you, but like a love for everybody and everything. And of course, that's what the Beatles and particularly John Lennon went through in the 60s and all you need is love. And Tomorrow and Never Knows, many that whole like Tomorrow that. Never Knows, which people yeah, mistake absolutely. for a drug song, but it's such a profoundly religious experience is described it's based yeah. on a religious text isn't it yeah 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 I, I don't think these kind of guys driving around the country in vans in the 60s playing gigs in dance halls would never have become these kind of spiritual sages if it hadn't have been for lsd they they never would have gone to india and understood what was going on but they they suddenly talked to people like ravi shankar or read autobiography of a yogi and, and they, they connected with that. They, they, they thought these people are talking about the same sort of thing that I've experienced. And of course the, I mean, Ravi Shankar really didn't like that. He didn't think, he didn't like the idea that people could take this apparent shortcut with LSD and, and have experiences that took him years to attain. Interestingly, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous took LSD in the, in the fifties and was like my god it's a spirit to experience in a pill and was a great addict people don't really talk about this in meetings it shows you the frailty of individuals yeah, I can uh, he, he, ended, he ended up uh, converting to catholicism or nearly converting to catholicism shortly before he died but he um during the 60s when aa was booming bill wilson was writing to all kinds of people about the, ben- the new benefits of lsd because it could take you from step one to 12 in an afternoon and um and eventually the, the the sort of he didn't run aa he just founded it and it was he set it up very cleverly as an individual self-governing organization it's a, it's a model of anarchy really effectively working and people had to sit down and say you need to stop talking about this lsd stuff mate and you probably need to stop taking it because we know you're doing it under experimental circumstances but um it's uh, it's really a drug so yeah, yeah. it's uh what you're saying there is quite yeah. true, Steve. It's it's and and lots. 
that so that collapse of ego is really important in the spiritual experience as henry james you know that's what that's all about isn't it the the varieties of spirits experience and that's what that's what lsd does it it collapses your ego i think to a certain extent and john you 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 seem very very partial and almost like tempted by christianity still it seems like no i <laughs> there's something kind of unfinished i have uh, i have a euphoric recall about it i think i uh, i i many of my best friends are christians uh they they're a joy to work with my my most valued work colleagues most of them are christians and um uh uh, I I just because I, you can trust them because <laughs> they have a moral core and um, I think it's a profoundly important thing for for effective. If you think about you know early human activity, which which assuming people aren't a young you know young earth creationists as, as Dylan was for a while, um, and pos- well, I don't know if he still is, but certainly was for a while when you saw him you know if you if if that idea of people existing in small groups for a long period of time is true um outside of current society then you have to have a way of regulating behavior that doesn't involve hitting each other and so those kind of collective experiences that are based on people acting morally together are really important to us and and in in the in the 20th century in the united kingdom that was christianity I guess I would I would ask you, John, in that sense, though, uh, is the the fact that we can trace, you know, a socio sociological evolutionary explanation, you know, for things and maybe chemical explanations for certain types of religious experience in the brain. I mean, I, I don't know many, well, many Christians who have thought about it who would who would mm. divorce entirely that aspect of things from faith and and you know of course something's happening in your brain when you're having an experience. It's not like it happens somehow independently of your physical makeup. But they would say it's too reductive to say it can all be explained materially because there's so much about it that just seems to, you know, just the, the, the problem mm. of consciousness, frankly, is still a huge issue. It's like, how do we get these extraordinary experiences from just this physical stuff if that's all ultimately that's going on is the interaction of physical matter? So, so I can understand why some people don't want to say it's all being explained now if you like and want to leave the door open to to the divine mm. in that sense and, and i guess you oh, can understand sure that, and there too. are many scientists there are many very highly qualified working professional scientists who are who are quite devout christians too and muslims and people of other faith as well and hindus and um you know so the the yeah i don't have a problem with that i'd never i'd never want to do anything that undermines somebody's faith i think it's a really important part of the human experience and um I get. I, I remember um, one of the guys who stood for president in America was a Seventh Day Adventist and uh, Young Earth. He's a Young Earth creationist, but he's also he's an African American guy. And I can't remember his name. Is it Ben something? But Ben. Yes. Ben. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, Carson. And he's also one of the world's leading yeah, yeah. Uh, brain surgeons. And people were so dismissive about his faith. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. and. And I just thought, wow, this this is one. This person has done more, probably because of his faith, has been put in a position to do more to benefit more people than than you could imagine. Uh, certainly more than I ever have done. And um, so I, I I guess I believe people are entitled to believe whatever they want, uh, as long as they're not harming other people. Um, and, I, and that just doesn't go for Christianity with me. I, I you know, I, I work with lots of people. I have lots of students yeah. who kind of are, are in that kind of world of you, you can't say anything that that offends people. And I, I, I profound my my profound core belief is that people have a right to faith and they have a right to their own opinions, even ones that I find distasteful, as well as ones that I mm. really think of. Yeah very beneficial but don't happen to share such as christian faith or any other kind of faith i I just people everyone everyone has an entitlement to their own worldview and Mm. if you start interfering with that then you're looking at thought police and all kinds of difficult things and i think that's that's somewhere i wouldn't want to go so yeah i celebrate diversity of opinion and thought well it's it's been such a such an interesting conversation between you both thank you a- any final thoughts steve as as we start to wrap the, the oh, show yeah up? I, my one thought would be um we often start talking about transcendental states of mind etc but 
I can't. <laughs> I, uh, my, my Christian life is, is, doesn't consist of a string of transcendental moments. Um, uh, there, there are times, but it, there tend to be times when I think everything's falling into place. Everything seems right. You know, God is looking after me. God is there. But not. I, I've not. When Van Morrison described his experiences to me, I mean, I've never had that. Uh, I've never had that feeling of being whipped up or carried away or, or, or of blending in with the cosmos or anything like that. So um, I, I, I mean, so some religions sell themselves on like this is what you'll get. You know, if you cross your legs, sit like this, you'll have this experience. But um, for me, Christianity, that's. I mean, Jesus just doesn't say, you know, follow me and I'll give you a transcendental experience. Mm. Um, and it's also, one of the things I most admire about Christianity and the discussions I've had with Christian friends is that doubt is such an important fault. And, and, and I think security of, mm. of, of your opinions is one of the most dangerous places to be, um, you know, and, and just sort of testing yourself and re-examining your ideas all the time. I think it's really important being open to to new ways of looking at the world is really important. It's the essence of, you know, Christianity in that sense. And, and that's why I think it's it's such a valuable social force because it, it's been through a reformation, which has involved looking at itself and thinking about, okay, this is different ways of mm. practicing it. And, and then it accepts it from whether, you know, from sort of the Unitarian church all the way through to fairly, you know, rigorous, the we freeze in Scotland or something everyone's a christian mm. and um mm. or maybe not the new Unitari unitarians but you know what i mean uh, there's uh, still a church right and um yeah. so so everyone yeah, that inclusivity is really important and 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 um it's the principle of that i think that is should be defended at all costs and and then within that people mm. people can make their own interpretation of it that's what a god for me would want of us rather than a god that says i'll give you this massive you know spiritual experience if you do what i tell you it's a slightly different way of thinking which is what i think has allowed them all the good in them yeah. that is in the modern world to come about and it's a great practical way to live you know i i got a lot done uh, as a result of that it was yeah i do miss it interesting Th thank you so much for for the conversation steve and john today um really really interesting um as i've said there are links to both of my guests john stewart's book dylan lennon marks and god and also uh, many of Steve's books as well. Um, look for the links with today's show for more. But um, it's been great to have you both on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.